And welcome to the Culture Bunker. This is a massive archive of Manchester culture covering music, sport and everything else. Now this particular one is all about the late great Tony Wilson or Anthony H. Wilson as he called himself to annoy people. Uh, back in 2007, about three months after he died, I decided to put together a massive tribute show to Tony Wilson and interview lots of people about his life and in many ways use those interviews to tell the story of Manchester music. Um, so there's various individual interviews that I did and these are raw and uncut. So I'm not cut anything out, I'm just delivering them to you, not as they went out on the radio at the time and not as anyone else has heard them. Uh, this first one is Peter Hook of New Order and Joy Division fame, talking about Tony Wilson, talking about when he first met him, the days of Joy Division and what Tony meant to him and also about the last time he saw Tony Wilson again. I hope you enjoy it. Do subscribe, it's very important. The more of you subscribe, the more of this great archive I can upload for you to see. Hello, I'm Peter Hook, the bass player with Joy Division and New Order and um, I suppose you could say co-runner at the, the Hacienda in Manchester. God, that seems such a hazy memory now, the first dealings I had with Tony, it seems. I mean, we used to see him at all the gigs. I remember seeing him at the second uh, Free Trade Hall Sex Pistols gig and then you'd occasionally see him, like I saw him when Eater played at Holsworth Hall on Dean's Gate and Bellevue, Susie and the Banshees and The Clash and stuff. So he, he, he was quite well known because he was a TV celebrity. But um, I think the thing was is that once we got into music and you realised that he had the power, or you thought he had the power, then um, because he was ignoring our tapes, I suppose you'd say, I think that was what happened. Um, Ian in particular took a healthy dislike to him quite early on. Basically, the only places you went socially were all the concerts. So the thing is, is that he was there. You know, I mean, he was very friendly with Martin Hannett, who was running a lot of the concerts then. Martin had a concert promotion agency with Suzanne's girlfriend, and they used to put a lot of the gigs on. Um, we played in our second ever gig when we supported Johnny Thunders at Rafters as Warsaw. Um, we played for Martin. Um, Alan Wise was the other co-promoter, and we didn't get paid. Yeah, it was quite interesting. So he was always there because the band that were supposed to support us that night were Fast Breeder, who was managed by Alan Erasmus. Um, so it was quite a little clique. So we didn't have to stalk him, really. He was always there. And uh, Ian was very, very passionate about us. And I think he really took it personally that, you know, Tony didn't um, leap on us and make us his favourites straight away. There was the memorable occasion at the Stiff Chiswick Challenge when um, I think emotions were running a bit high, is how we'd put it, because of um, the negatives, which was Paul Morley and Kevin Cummings' band, use inverted commas, um, had managed to push us off, and we were really incensed about that. So we chased them out, actually, which was them were the good, good old days then, weren't they? Chased them out of rafters, and then um, Ian had his, his famous fracas with Tony over the, the billiard table. Just got hold of him and called him a words that you can't use on the radio. Um, just because I think he felt ignored, you know. He thought we were the best thing in the world. And I think the great thing about groups is, is that if you don't have self-belief, then you're not going to really go anywhere. And Ian did have that self-belief about us. And so he took it personally that, you know, he felt Tony was ignoring him. It, you know, it, it's, I think one of the great things about Tony Wilson was that he was a rebel. And he always seemed to get away with it. He could be as rebellious as he wanted. I, I remember the, the fracas at the Stiff Chiswick and then Rob Gretton came on board as our manager. Once Rob became our manager, um, his dialogue with Tony was what opened up our relationship. I remember um, there, there being interest in Tony wanting to do the factory sample, which we went along to do. With uh, That was when we met Martin and Alan Erasmus, so it was only when we went to the studio, really, that we, we you know, cemented the relationship with him and Alan, really. The, the interesting thing about Factory Records and um, Tony's, Wilson's role in our career was that I think Rob, now that I look back at Rob, I'd say he, he very much liked to be in control. And um, I don't mean the film, <laughs> but bum. Um, he wanted to be in control 
And I think he felt that when he started meeting the record company from London and A&R men and stuff, I think he felt a little out of his depth. And I think that he, he, he must have thought, oh, I don't like this, you know. They are strange people down there, or they were then. Mm. And I think the thing was is that when Tony started talking to him about carrying on the record label after the factory sample, I think Rob quite early on decided it would be better for us, better for him, if because we'd keep control, we'd stay where we loved, which was Manchester, where we were a sort of big fish in a small pond, as opposed to going down to London and becoming a small small fish in a big pond. And I think that the financially, even though you didn't take an advance, we got offered an advance by Genetic, um, which was quite a lot of money, 72000 I think they offered us in 1979, which was a hell of a lot of money. But I think the fact that it was so much money just went over our heads. And, you know, you know, they've offered this much, but I think we should stay with Factory Records. And we all just went, oh, OK, then. <laughs> in, the, in the long run, it was the best decision we ever made because it kept, it gave you, um, it made you special. Whereas if you'd have just gone to London and signed to Genetic, you'd have been normal. You wouldn't have done anything. You wouldn't have taken any chances. You wouldn't have, you know, it, it, was, just, it was just a very normal thing to do. And I think the thing is, is that I think that we were happy here you know and uh, i think it was a very easy decision for us to just stay as we are you know the interesting thing i find about joy division as uh, as i talk about it after the film is is that from the beginning of joy division to the end of joy division our circumstances never changed we still didn't have two eightness to rub together from the start to the end and the only thing that changed was was that you lost a friend you know someone who was really important to you because financially or, you know, even on a gigging thing, it was still very, very difficult. It was very, very hard work uh, as a group. Th there were no frills, you know. It was, it was as hard when we finished as it was when we started. We weren't making more money or we weren't being treated better. It was still very difficult. So it was, it was quite an interesting thing to, to look at, the history of Joy Division from our point of view, because when we came New Order, we had the Hacienda, and everything changed then. But I think that the thing was you, you sort of put that association down to new order. Oh, this is like a new beginning, you know, with the Hacienda. I mean, it was Joy Division's money that paid for the Hacienda. That, that's a fact, you know, without Ian. I mean, as Pete Savile says, if Ian hadn't killed himself, there probably would be no Hacienda. Again, you see, I mean, the thing is, is that we were so young and naive and stroke stupid, we weren't really bothered about that. I mean, the fact that you could go somewhere for free was, oh, great, that's really good, because I have to pay a pound to get in rafters. But if you open your own club, you can get in for free. Oh, I saved a quid there. And Rob said um, it'd come straight out of factory. It wouldn't be our, you know, it wouldn't affect us, really. I think we were on 30 quid a week by then. And, um, you know, so it wasn't really a, that big a decision to make. Um, I think we started making big money in factory very early on, actually. But thanks to creative accounting, uh, we never really knew because Rob's relationship with Tony was very, very um, fractious and they fought like cat and dog all the time. And I think the thing that Tony loved was that whenever Rob wanted money, he had to come into Tony and ask for it. And Tony used to lord it over him. And, you know, there was no accounting. We didn't get paid every month or every quarter. It was when Rob needed money, he'd have to go and ask Tony for it. So depending on what mood Tony was in, they'd either end up having a huge argument or it'd be always 10 grand, you know. I mean, it's still amazing, really, that for all our years on Factory, right to the end of New Order, that we've never been accounted to for how many records we sold. We still don't know how many records we sold because the Factory didn't do accounts. <laughs> Did our money get used for other bands on Factory? Uh, I think I can say categorically, yes. I think it ran it. And um, I mean, it, Rob it always had a peculiar way of looking at life. His thing was, was that you, you had to give something back and he, he believed a lot in karma, which, which I think uh, I've taken on board now. But he, the thing that shocked us was that when he said you had to give something back, you know, we didn't realise he meant everything. You know, now with the benefit of hindsight, you, you, you can see that he made a lot of mistakes. But the thing is, is that, you know, you, you created something with Tony and Rob and the Hacienda, something really special. And I think that that stands you in good stead with whatever you do. And I think that maybe as a group... 
um, I'm guilty of it, is that you sort of underestimate the, the, the longevity and the, the power that acting like that has given you in your career. And I think the thing is, is that as I get older, and you know, by working with the Hacienda as, as, as deeply as I have in these past few years, I realize that people really appreciate and love the, the attention to detail that Factory had and the fact that they weren't in it for the money. You know, they were in it to, I suppose you'd have to say, to, to, to change the world because that's what they did. And it, it makes me wonder whether, you know, Tony and Rob knew they were changing the you know the, this way of music the music world while they were doing it i mean it was pretty revolutionary everything that they did tony and rob everything they instigated was quite revolutionary you know every, everything it was it was an amazing attention to detail they really did put a lot of heart and soul into covers and things like that so that the whole thing became a very very attractive package so it conjured up an air if you like it wasn't just a record that record came with the, the myth of factory you know the myth of the hacienda the the way that everybody acted even when uh, you know is that story true about blue monday and that the covers were, were so expensive that you lost yeah the, it's the the cover of blue monday was 10p more expensive than the profit on the record so we lost 10p on every copy that had the hole punched in the sleeve and as Steve Morris very rightly likes to point out it was the bits that you didn't get that cost the money the hole <laughs> so the bit that they were taking out it's because that in the old days of doing sleeves the there was three holes punched in Blue Monday and they had to go in three machines to punch those holes Nowadays, I think they can do anything with just one machine. So that's what made it so expensive. Plus the colours and the finish that Savile used. I mean, it, again, it's that thing, you know. I mean, Blue Monday probably has stood us in a great stead. And, you know, I still earn money from it when I get my PRS now. But And it, and it does think, well, would it be better without that sleeve? Or would I get more? You know, it's like you're never going to know. So you have to take what you created and what Savile did which was revolutionary. I mean, Savile put Blue Monday out as a floppy disk. And when you ally that to the fact that technology was changing and Blue Monday was like deemed to be the pinnacle of that new music technology that used floppy disks, the timing of that is unbelievable. Rob, Rob and I used to fight like mad with Tony about the Hacienda because Tony's, uh, I remember the, we, we actually headhunted this guy and brought him in as uh, assistant manager. And we had him at the meeting and um, Rob and I had gone off to do something and we came back and the kid had gone and we said to Tony, where's he gone? You know, he said, oh, I didn't like him, he was too businesslike. I've thrown him out. <laughs> so we sacked him because we were like, oh God, Tony, you know. And this was like in 92 in the Hacienda when everybody's house was on the line. You know, we were really staring disaster in the face and he, he could be infuriating, you know, in, in that respect. And... Rob in particular used to just fight constantly with him and all the rest of us would sort of jockey around it, you know. God, I mean, the movie thing is... is I was looking at the Golden Globe nominations um, last night and, uh, you know, Control's up for three. Uh, three Golden Globes, which is amazing, you know. It really has taken off. And 24-hour party people, Michael Winterbottom did us the greatest favour in the world there. That film has just re... It renewed New Order's career, renewed the interest in the factory and the Hacienda so much. You know, you get in a taxi in Istanbul or whatever, and the guy asks where you're from, and you say Manchester, and he goes, oh, United, 24-hour party people. You know, like, what? You know, it's that far, the the impact that it's had. But, I mean, it, it's funny, really, because I was thinking the other day, um, there, there was actually a factory Zimbabwe, that we opened a studio in Zimbabwe, and there was a factory Poland, and uh, Factory America actually was uh, spectacularly, which ended up putting out fall records, which uh, I never truly understood. But there's, there's a lot of things that Factory did, you know, and as you saw, as these things come back to you out of the mists of time, they, they, they really do amaze you. But what I loved about Tony was, was that Tony and Rob had that thing where they, they, they'd take a chance like this guy in Zimbabwe got in touch with them and said oh you know I really admire what you're doing daddy I'm trying to do it here so he said but we you know we haven't got money to to set up a studio or anything I'd love to record um, our local musicians so Tony and Rob sent him some money and uh, he opened a studio called Factory Zimbabwe and recorded local musicians and put out a, a factory single which was Lovell Tears Apart with Atmosphere on the other side 
And so, you know, it, it was actually, it, it's a nice thing that you, you, they always wanted to, to put something back so that it would grow, so that this whole thing would grow. And the interesting thing was, it was like Factory Poland was actually very successful, but they couldn't pay you because they weren't allowed to send money out of Poland. So Arne Erasmus came up with this deal whereby we'd, we'd, we'd swapped a train load of nails and slate in, for, in view in lieu of royalties. And uh, it ended up rotting for about 10 years on the sidings in Poland in some God knows where, you know. I mean, truth is stranger than fiction. And And then in the end, he converted this train load of nails and whatever it was into uh, Polish slotties and left them in Poland for something like 25 years and then when they cashed them in they were worth like hundreds <laughs> don't know why I'm laughing of um, of what it was originally you know so I mean, there was a lot of things they did that was really really wacky but I did like the way that you know the cottage industry thing that if somebody asked them they, they they'd consider it uh, I saw Tony for the last time on the day of Bernard's wedding, actually. Um, I took Tom Atencio down to... Um, Tom Atencio was going to Bernard's wedding and he was going in and out really quickly and uh, I had not seen Tony for a while, so he, he, he asked me if I'd take him down to see Tony and we went to see Tony and Yvette, um, which is about only about two weeks. I can't remember how long it was before he died. I, I went to see him in hospital and, uh, and stuff, but it, it was really frightening. Uh, my mate Dave D from Dave D Dogsy Beacon Mick and Titch took me down and he'd suffered with cancer and uh, he was in the same ward as, as Tony and he, he said to me he said you know okay you've got to prepare yourself when you're going you, you really do you know and uh, it, it, it was really horrible it was shocking to see someone you, you know you loved so someone who's such a big part of your life because my parents God rest their souls both died quite quickly so Tony did become a father figure to me, more so than Rob. I think Rob felt like a, a contemporary, like a friend, but Tony always felt like he was he was one removed from you, you know, more like the head of the family as opposed to a brother. And, yeah, he did have that feeling. I mean, he, he was fantastic. He, he, he really used to look after us, and uh, sometimes you, you'd see when he changed from bullshit mode to proper... I'm going to tell you something now for your own good, which he did on several occasions, quite recently, actually, because of the fracas with New Order. And he was a real help. And, you know, I, I think it was that thing he, he said very early on to us all when we were moaning about him. He, he, he won the competition, I think, for record company executives for flying around the world. He'd spent the most money flying around the world than any other record company executive, which he was immensely proud of. £354,000 worth of air tickets in a year, and as Rob Gretton said, and achieved nothing. <laughs> and uh, it, 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 was, it was one of those funny things that whenever you wanted him, he was never there. You know, and I went through this with Revenge and Monaco. When, when you really needed a bit of advice, he was never there. You know, you wanted him. And he always said to me, he said, uh, well, he said to us all, he said, you know, when you want me, I won't be there. But when you need me, I will. And it proved to be true over the, you know, the 30 years of our relationship. It was true. When you really needed him or needed someone to kick you up the arse, he would drop all the, as Trotsky once said, bullshit and give it you, which you, you know, you had to be grateful for. Oh, God, I mean, the whole the thing about control, which, which I found particularly diff difficult, is, is that you, you, you're surrounded by, by dead people. And it's it's really difficult thing. Well, <clears throat> I mean, it, it's not an enviable position to be in losing Tony Wilson, uh, Rob Gretton, Ian Curtis, Martin Hannett, and God, a myriad of other people as, as we go through, you know, as we get older. It has been very, very difficult. And uh, I think the thing about the film is, is that it, it puts you in this position where you're talking about the past all the time. As a, as a, as a musician, you, you, you tend to only look forward to your next record. You don't want to celebrate the last one. You don't want anything to do with anything that's happened in the past. You, you're sort of trained to think about your next one, and then the next one's the one, and then you carry on. And the thing I found extremely difficult about... Is, I mean, the grieving part was very difficult anyway, but you, because of control, you, you, you're talking about the pain 
all the time, you know, the pain of Ian Curtis, the pain of Factory going under, the pain of the Hacienda, the pain of bloody New Order going under, you know, and splitting and everything. You, you, you concentrate. It can actually be very, very depressing. It really drags you down. Um, but then again, you know, like, I mean, I did a factory night in Brussels at weekend with Section 25 and the names and Kevin Hewick and Martin Mosscrop was DJing. And then you get there and people are like are so happy. And there was hundreds of factory records, you know, for me, for you to sign and hundreds of people showing you things that they'd, they'd saved. And, and you're like that. Wow. You know, and it, it's moments like that that bring it home to you that, that what we did together was revolutionary. It changed the world and the world of music and the world of commerce in the way that Factory's record company acted. And you, it's that easy to forget that when you dwell on the negative side of it. And then, you know, to get people that were celebrating it as much as they were. And I was listening to the kids DJing, and these were young kids DJing before me and before Martin. They were playing really obscure Factory records. And one of them even played the, the Rob Gretton, Ian Curtis conversation that I put on the Hacienda CD. He played it, you know, as a track in the club, and I'm like, wow. And that, that is so easy for me to take for granted that it means nothing to me. And yet, you know, you forget how much it means to other people, how much the Hacienda meant to a generation of people in, in and around Manchester, you know, that Tony and Rob gave them because Bernard, Stephen, and I, if they'd have asked us, we'd have just said no. <laughs> And that is the truth, you know, as much as we enjoyed it and maybe as much as we regret the, you know, the financial implications, we wouldn't have had the foresight to do it, but them two did. I mean, the, the, the interesting thing I find about New Order's success, which obviously came to us via Tony Wilson and Rob Gretton, is that when the last time we split up, although we don't call it a split, we're not, not allowed to call it a split when we split up, um, we, 1990, we'd just done three gigs. We did 35,000 people in Toronto. We did 29,000 in Los Angeles and another huge one in Denver of about 28,000 people. And it really cheers me when I look at Oasis and we were three times bigger than Oasis I've ever been and bigger than the Spice Girls or anything. And that was just us lot, four working class tossers from Salford with Tony Wilson and Rob Gretton got to that pitch in America, you know. And when you, as we were saying before, you and I, when you talk about how awkward and how you rise to the occasion of being that awkward, northern, sarcastic, you know, sense of humour that we love. And we just took that round the world in front of all those people. And it, 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 made, it did, really did make a mark. It was amazing. You know, it, it makes me very happy when I think about that now, you know. All right, well... Um my my only Tosh Ryan story that I do know is um, he bought a Jensen Interceptor with the advance for the uh, Slaughter and the Dogs when they signed. And uh, he didn't want the band to know he bought this Jensen Interceptor, I presume for obvious reasons. And uh, he parked it outside factory and told Alan Erasmus to have a to look after it for him, you know. And then uh, Wayne Barrett, God bless him, found out when they came round Slaughter and the Dogs and torched it on the drive outside factory. <laughs> Which I suppose is quite ironic because that meant neither of them had it. The band didn't get it and the manager didn't get it. I suppose it's like when you compare it to the Stone Roses or, or New Order's fracas, it's quite an interesting one, that one.